One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. And as they were sailing, he fell asleep. Where is your faith? Let's uh, pray, shall we? Father, we thank you that uh, we can come to your word this morning, and uh, Lord, that we can um, just seek truth today for our lives, uh, Lord, for our lives individually, but our life as a church as well. And uh, Father, I just pray that you would um, uh, guide our hearts today, uh, would speak into our lives, um, help us to be open to your leading today, in Jesus' name, Amen. Last Sunday, um, Malcolm talked about the first parable in Mark, which was the parable of the sun. And uh, here today is the calming of the storm, the first so-called nature miracle uh, of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. So it's a couple of firsts. The first parable, the first nature miracle of Jesus. So a bit of context and um, just a bit of background. This account takes place on the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's not actually known very often by that now. It was more of its biblical name. Uh, also known as Lake Kinneret, uh, Lake uh, Genezaret, Lake Tiberius. Um, and it's the largest freshwater lake in Israel. It's approximately 53 kilometres in circumference. It's about 21 k's long and 13 k's wide. And, um, you know, when the wind gets up on our lake, set on the main lake here or one of the other lakes around here, and it sort of gets a little bit choppy and we sort of say it's quite rough, well, it's nothing compared to what it can get like on this particular lake on the Sea of Galilee. Um, this lake is almost unique in the world and it's been studied by scientists all over the place. It has very uh, severe winds that come up unbelievable waves for a lake and it still happens today. The pictures you saw were probably not that far-fetched. The lake sits in a bowl and it's surrounded by mountains um, and the heat um, and the winds that come in through, through the mountain passes um, cause these types of waves and it usually comes at a particular time of the day, I think around the middle of the day, but also it can be these unexpected uh, storms as well, can even be worse uh, with that. It was also a wonderful fishing ground, and uh, so many of the disciples, of course, were fishermen, and uh, they would have been used, you would think, to the vagaries of um, this lake. The sea, the lake generally, not just this lake, was where the Jews believed that evil and God clashed. They were almost, if you like, superstitious about it. 
And uh, Jesus continues to spend much of his time by the Sea of Galilee, and he even ventures across the lake on occasions, and uh, also in this passage. Our message today is titled, Fear Leading to Faith. You know, fear is an important part of our lives, if harnessed correctly. We are going to face fear, trials, and storms in our lives, and each of us has a great need to ensure our full security is only found in Jesus, a serenity that this world does not know and cannot give. So let's look at the passage and see what it has to say about fear and faith. We'll read the verses as we go. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with them. So what was the reason that Jesus was on the lake? Jesus had had a busy day, and uh, he maybe needed to leave the crowd behind. But the beginning of the next chapter that Malcolm will look at next week also tells us that they went across the lake to this region of uh, Gerasenes. So his trip today also had a purpose uh, to get to the other side. And um, his purpose was to, to uh, minister, not just uh, in retreat, um, in the boat with the disciples. There were also um, other boats on the lake, perhaps the bigger group of disciples or just um, interested people. We don't know for sure, but we're told that there were other boats there as well. And in a deeper sense, in another sense, the boat in some ways becomes an image of those who travel in intimate fellowship with Jesus, separated from uh, other followers and the masses who stand in the security on the shore. So the intimate fellowship of those in the boat and separated from the followers uh, of the masses who stand in security at, on, the, on the shore. I wonder where you stand uh, in your life today. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? So it's Christine's read. The storm comes up and it's pretty furious. It's a squall, fairly major. So much so as we saw in the, in the clip, uh, the water was coming right over the boat and it could have sunk uh, because it was swamped. Jesus was in the back of the boat and uh, we can imagine at the close um, of a full day of teaching the perhaps some, sometimes hardened hearts that um, he was just physically tired, exhausted. Remember Jesus is fully divine but he was also fully human as well. So here was Jesus sleeping. We are told he was on a cushion or resting on a cushion. Probably actually a, a sand bed, which they used to ballast, um, translated here as a cushion. So Jesus is sleeping and the disciples are terrified because of these huge waves. There's a deeper significance here too. Jesus asleep in the midst of a raging storm is a sign of trust in God. And it contrasts uh, with the terror of the disciples. You see, the disciples didn't understand Jesus sleeping. They regarded it as a token of indifference to their safety when danger was confronting them. It's, what, it's quite ironic, isn't it, that Jesus was the carpenter, kind of a land lover, probably, sleeping while the experienced sailors amongst them are petrified. So they wake him and they throw this question at him. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? And you can almost hear the indignant wail of complaint in this question, as if Jesus was responsible for their predicament. And you and I might well think it's a reasonable question. I kind of think it was, because they didn't have the full understanding of Jesus that we do. And what's the answer they're looking for? They're looking, of course, for the answer, yes, yes, I do care for you. But also suggests that they were peeved with his apparent lack of concern. 
It must have been very hard for the disciples to comprehend that Jesus asked them to get into the boat, to go to the other side of the lake, and they did this with unquestioning faith and obedience, and now they were fearing for their lives, and he was having a moi. He was sleeping. Doesn't he care? The disciples' fear in the face of the storm overwhelms them. They feared for their lives. This causes me to think that there are two faces of fear. The first one is, is fear helpful to us? And the other face is, is fear unhelpful to us? What is fear? Author John Ortberg put it like this, at its simplest and most benign <laughs> fear is an internal warning cry that danger is nearby and we had better do something about it. It is designed to be what researchers call a self-correcting mechanism, to be unpleasant enough to motivate us to take action and remove ourselves from whatever is threatening. It readies our body to flee, hide or fight. So one face of fear then is that it does have a place in our lives. Fear can motivate us, it gets the adrenaline going and can, pre can prepare us for what may be ahead and guide us. But the other face of fear is, more neg is a more negative face in that it can paralyse us. It causes us to freeze on a short-term or a long-term basis. Um, just a while back, um, we had a family holiday, of, well, actually quite some time, and um, we saved up and we were going to Rainbow's End. And we were really excited about this. And um, once we got there, um, well, the boys just took off. And um, they were running to, to the... Um, uh, fearful, um, what's it called? Fear? Fearful. Fearful yeah. ride. And so um, we were running behind them, and then the boys said to me, Oh, Mum, come, come on this ride with us. And um, I kind of got caught up in the excitement of it all, and um, silly me decided that I'll go too. Um, and I thought, Oh, it can't be that big, really. Anyway, we go on this ride, and it takes us right up to the heavens. And um, I was starting to get really scared, and I actually don't know heights. Oh, it was really foolish of me, <laughs> and it was too late. And we got right up to the top, and the boys were um, yahooing and carrying on, and I was starting to feel quite sick. And they said, "Mum, look out and see this wonderful view." And I had a look, and I thought, "Oh my goodness, we are just so high up." And um, then my palms were sweating and I was in a bad way. And then they don't drop you straight away. They have you just sitting there. And um, I thought, oh, look, they're going to drop us any time. And, you know, the boys were still yahooing. And then the next minute they dropped us and we were going down really fast. And I remember in, with that ride, oh, please stop, please stop. It was just terrifying and um, I just I nearly couldn't stand it and then we got to the end and I thought thank goodness that's over and um, I we got off the ride and the boys were fine about it and I thought I would never go on that ride again and I heard another lady she came off the ride and she said I would never do that again it was really the, just yeah the fear of it was paralyzing to me that's right, it did motivate. <laughs> and I was down at the bottom taking photos. <laughs> <laughs> and then a uh, fear that I um, experienced as a long term fear was when I supported um, a friend through um, anxiety, coping with anxiety. And um, I learned uh, through that that it um, can be quite crippling. Um, it can be controlling, and um, so uh, we learnt strategies, um, and we learnt how this one could cope better, um, coping yeah with, with that fear of it, and yeah the fears that go with anxiety. How would you have reacted in the storm? 
I think I might have been like the disciples too. Even when witnessing the works of Jesus, but when crisis confronts us, our courage melts away. How do you get on facing fear? Does it prepare you? Does it motivate and guide you? Or paralyze you? Causing you to be anxious? Jesus in this event was expressing to the disciples that their fears were unfounded. David Riddell, who's a uh, counsellor and uh, a Christian counsellor uh, psychologist, um, he has a wonderful um, truth coach, um, and that's like a, a truth to help us to stand on. And that's um, um, for those unfounded fears. And he says, check your feelings. They are not always a reliable guide to how things are. So back to our passage, verse 39. He got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. So firstly, Jesus rebukes the wind, he calms the storm, he shows his sovereign power, and it happened. And Jesus has mastery over the sea, the so-called place of chaos and evil in Jewish thought. It's interesting that he rebuked with only a few words and um, I think sometimes to ask for the power of God we need only a few words, not a huge amount of Christian jargon necessarily. It's the sincerity of the heart that asks that I think is important. You know, had the disciples known that they had set to see this one with such great power, their fears would be groundless. And another interesting principle here is that Jesus uh, didn't talk to them initially. He got up and he went and dealt with uh, the problem before he addressed them. And sometimes we can try to deal with the symptom of a problem, of something that's troubling us, something in our life, without allowing, allowing Christ to deal with the deeper issue. I would say deal with the main thing first. The next thing I notice in this account is, is that there's two features of faith. Two features of faith. And the first feature is that we need to grow in our faith. In verse 40, he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? This is the question. Do you still have no faith? Another translation says, you of little faith. And faith uh, here is the Greek word pistis. Uh, belief is trust with an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. Hebrews 11.1, 1, that well-known verse from Scripture tells it, faith is uh, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And faith here refers to, to faith, trust, and the divine power present in the person of Jesus. In this particular context, that's what it's meaning. And Jesus, in asking this question, may have been saying to his disciples, uh, can't, can't you see in me from scriptures that I'm God? And I wonder if he was recalling something like Psalm 46, which would have been his scriptures and the scriptures of the disciples as well. God is a, our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Who can still the fury of oppressors, though they roar like the waves of the sea? As the disciples showed their faith, or lack of it, Jesus revealed who he was. They then, by default, got to know him more, and through this grew in their faith. The words, have faith, don't be afraid, have faith, are expressed many times in the Bible. Our Christian pilgrimage is one of growing in our faith. How do we grow in our faith? We need to read the Bible. We need to pray. We need one another to encourage in the faith. How can we move out in faith by word and action if we do not know his word? The, the disciples needed to grow in theirs, and facing the storm was part of getting to know him more. What is your faith like? as you face fear or storms in your life. 
Basically, Jesus was saying to the disciples, come on fellas, you've got to know who I am. You don't know who I am. You have the creator of the universe in the boat. A storm is no match for me. Why fear? In verse 41, they were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the second feature of faith is that we need to know who it is that we have faith in. You know, the disciples weren't expecting to see Jesus uh, do what he did at all. After sub Jesus subdued the waters and, and the wind, the disciples were terrified. And they were terrified of him, and it had them asking, who is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. They were afraid of Jesus, of what he was able to do, and stems from Jesus' uh, God-like control of the sea. They still only had a vague inkling of who this man is in the midst, in their midst. Who wields such power? Jesus was revealing who he was by what he did. A new revelation to the disciples. He showed them he is Lord of nature and the God of miracles. He reveals he has power to do what only the God who created the sea can do. Jesus has mastery over the sea, the place of chaos, as God does. Christ was revealing his full deity as creator as well as redeemer, with the disciples questioning to one another, who is this Jesus? It shows they were starting to realise just who he was. Do you know who Jesus is? Not just know bits about him, but have a deep and growing relationship with God. Do you know who is beside you in your trial or storm? He is the Almighty. Um, I like the name El, our strong ox and loving shepherd. At this stage, the disciples were afraid of Jesus' power. Do you have faith, trust, and the divine power present in the person of Jesus? Do you know him as your overcomer? The calming of the storm gives an announcement from Jesus that God reigns, that the hostile forces of Satan, wherever they might be, inside man, outside man, are being overthrown by Jesus, the Holy One of God. He restores God's dominion over a chaotic world, invaded by forces that wreak havoc and he, will, and he will return to do the same. As a family, um, we were in Christchurch um, before coming here, and um, we were there for the two um, big earthquakes and the thousands upon thousands of earthquakes um, before, in between and after. And um, I remember um, the second earthquake, I was at home, um, Paul was at work and the boys were at school and I, um, the house was moving and I knew straight away that this, this was another big earthquake and we had been expecting another one. Um, so, um, and we got pretty good to it, um, nailing um, where it might be on the Richter scale and I thought um, this is a, probably about a six. Um, over a six, and sure enough it was. And I remember um, I was, um, yeah, I was in the living area, and so I stood underneath the door frame, and I thought, I, um, do I move to get under the table? Um, so you have all these questions running through your mind when this is happening, and it's all happening so fast. And, um, you know, um, you, you do expect your house to stand, and I know for um, all of us, really, um, our security um, was threatened. Um, you know, we hoped that our, our homes would stand. We hoped that we wouldn't be in the city um, if we had a big earthquake, because um, we know that um, buildings do come down. And um, I, know, I knew at that stage that my security was in Christ, 
So, um, and, and also for my family, um, I knew that, um, you know, we were secure. Um, Paul was um, with God, the boys were, um, and that's where our security lay. And, um, yeah, so going through that, it did make us think, where does our security um, lie? And um, I remember at the end of the day, um, actually we got word that um, people had been dying in the city. So that second earthquake, although um, it wasn't um, as um, large as the first, it was worse in that people were dying. And um, so it was very sad. And I remember at the end of the day watching TV and crying. And although I had that sadness, I still knew I had security in Christ. See those verses, uh, just as Chris and sharing that, that our God is our refuge and strength became very important to uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people in our church, but also people in Christchurch. I've heard those words um, repeated quite a lot, a uh, lot of different things I was at over that period of time. So as we conclude here today, let's, let's just recap a little bit. There's two faces of fear. And uh, I wonder, do you let fear play its part in your life to motivate you? Or is it causing you problems? Maybe on a short-term basis, maybe it's a long-term thing. And fear can be very debilitating for us as well. And anxiety disorder can be um, can stop us from doing all sorts of things. Does it inhibit you in your life and in your Christian walk even more so? Maybe you don't yet know Jesus personally and you're struggling with your fears. I'd say let your fear motivate you to invite Christ into your life as your refuge and as your strength. And the other thing we've looked at today is that there's two features of faith. Are you growing um, in your faith in Jesus? Growing real pe people in faith is part of our vision that we established last year. Do you know Jesus? Is it a strong faith? See, a strong faith is a byproduct of knowing Jesus, of knowing who he is. And uh, he will help you with your fears and with your storms in life. You know, Mark helps us to learn to trust in a saviour who does not uh, deliver us from storms necessarily, but he helps us through the storms. He is our strength. He is our peace. And the question was asked, who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who delivers his people, and in his hands they are safe. He is our security, as Christians testified to as when we were lived in Christchurch. Don't be afraid. Have faith in an almighty God. Let your fear lead you to faith in our almighty God. Let us pray. Get the team to just come up.